Welcome to REIP Insights, a podcast that brings you the latest update on what is happening in the real estate market across Australia, as well as conversations with dynamic leaders sharing their insights and knowledge. They say leadership is lonely. However, it also requires enormous courage, resilience and bravery. In this leadership podcast, we bring you conversations with dynamic, successful leaders who are walking the leadership path. They share their stories, habits, and what drives them to be better leaders. This podcast is brought to you by REIP. We are a collective of industry leaders committed to empowering our industry and our clients. My conversation today is with Michelle Gibbings. She is the author of Bad Boss, What Do You Do If You Work For One? or manage one, or you are one. I just love this title. And I think we can all relate to one of these. Michelle is a global speaker and is on a mission to help leaders create successful workplaces. Please enjoy my conversation with the wonderful Michelle Gibbings. Now, Michelle is a global speaker and author of three books. She is on a mission to help leaders create successful workplaces. Michelle, welcome and congratulations on your latest book. I love the title, Bad Boss, What Do You Do If You Work For One or Manage One or You Are One? Now, I'm going to show the book here. Oh, there you go. You can just see it and I'll, there we go. Available in all book, good bookstores. Oh, thank you so much. I was going to say, and I can, you know, speak from experience. I have been in all three roles. <laughs> so I've worked for a bad boss. I've been a bad boss and I was a leader of a bad boss. So <laughs> there's lots of stories to tell. Okay. So a lot of, has, has a lot of them stories in the book from personal experience then? Look, they are. A lot of it's from personal experience. There's also heaps of research um, that underpins the work that I do and also the ideas that I share. Um, but I think what makes the the work and also the writing that I do powerful is I'm sharing from personal experience because mm. I think it's very easy to go, here's all this academic literature. But what brings it to life is when people can read something and go, I get where that person's coming from because they've lived it, they've experienced it, and also they've come through it. And particularly when I, you know, I stick my hand up right at the beginning and say, I was a bad boss. And part of doing that is to go, you know, it's okay. It's actually good as a leader to be able to admit what you're not good at and where you need to improve. And I think one of the challenges as a leader is that often we're lulled into this sense of, well, we can't admit that we can't do something. Um, And you actually need to, as a leader, acknowledge where you need to improve because that's the only way you'll ever get better. And can I ask, you know, you say you've been all three or you've been through all all of those roles. How did you come to the self-realisation that you're a bad boss or clearly the working one is different, but you yourself, was it feedback that somebody gave you or just through your own self-realisation? It was feedback. So there were probably two pivotal kind of episodes, one quite early in my management career. And, you know, I'd had this sort of, you know, you fall into a, a, a management role and, you know, because I'd be stretching the truth to call myself a leader, but I had a team that I managed and I was really excited because I was now a manager and I got the manager title and all that stuff that went with it. And I had preconceived ideas about what it meant to lead. And I was really lucky though. I worked for an amazing leader and I learned a lot from her. And she took me aside one day and she said, you know, Michelle, I get you're ambitious and I get that you want to do a good job. And you do. She goes, you do a great job. You get stuff done. You're incredibly reliable, you know, all that good stuff. But she said, you can drive things really hard. Mm. And she said, what you don't realize sometimes is the impact that you have on your team. And so it wasn't that I was, you know, I wasn't mean, I wasn't nasty, I didn't bully or victimize or any of that kind of classic what we see as bad boss, but I could drive things really hard. And because I can run fast, and I don't mean that literally because I'm not a good runner, but I mean in terms of getting things done. I would sometimes not see that my team were 10 steps behind me because I'd already figured stuff out. I was 10 steps ahead. And so they had this sense of exhaustion because it was like, we have to always run so hard to try and keep up with where you're up. Um, And so what this amazing boss said to me, she goes, you know, Michelle, one of the key things about you as a leader is, yes, you need to get the task done, but it's actually more about the people. If you can focus on the people, if you can bring out their best, if you can get them to places that they can't get to, but for the fact that they're working for you, 
you're leaving them in a better place. And that's your role is to leave them in a better place than where they were when you got there. And so it shifted my focus. And so I spent more time on people, less on the task. And so that was really pivotal. And then the second point was when I actually went through a formal 360 diagnostic feedback where, you know, I'd done a lot of development work by this stage and I was a much more effective leader and I got the feedback. It was like, wow, I still have work to do. Yeah. You know, it's so true. Like I've, I've, I think we all do that and I've done that in my own business and the teams that I've led, you know, you, you go at such a pace and you think that everybody's following you and they're all on board. And then at one point you turn around and you go, there's no one here with me. I'm the only one here out the front. <laughs> go back and restart. One of the things you say in the book is that people don't leave jobs, they leave their bosses, which is so, so, so true. I'm really interested to hear your um, thoughts on how we've seen leadership change because of COVID, you know, we, and we've all talked about it for those of us who are leaders, we've all talked about how that, that currency is changing. How, how, do you, how have you seen this play out in that leadership space? I think depends on where you're geographically located in some respects, because what's going on in Melbourne at the moment is so different. The experience is so different to if you are living in different states. You could feel like you're living on a different planet in some respects it's because of the emotional toll of what is going on in, in Melbourne. Um, and so I'm seeing really good leaders step up. Yeah. because they're recognizing the emotional toll they're recognizing also the impact it's having on them and i what i'm finding really interesting is when i'm talking to leaders and i'm saying to them you know who's taking care of you you know and are you spending enough time taking care of yourself so many of them are saying actually i'm not yes i i i actually i just haven't even thought about that because i'm putting my team first i'm trying to make sure i've got enough energy to be able to look after them and i you know i've, I've said to a number of people there's nothing wrong with occasionally being a bit selfish because part of you being an effective leader is you need to sometimes put yourself first. And by mm. that, I mean, taking care of your mental health and well-being. If you're not exercising and eating well and doing all the things that we logically know to take care of ourselves, you then don't have the emotional ability to be able to care for your team because what's going on at the moment, it, you can get to a point of emotional kind of exhaustion. Um, and, I, and I saw it the other day when I was running a session, every leader was just totally flat. And so it's recognizing that. Um, and I also think, you know, there have been many leaders who for a long time saw work from home as, a, ah, this can't work. Yes. And they've realized when you have no choice that there's actually lots of things that can work and can work really well. And so that's been a lovely thing in terms of a learning that work from home can work, can work well, but also it's really important to have boundaries around work from home because we're seeing the blurring between work yeah. life and home life. Yeah. Um, and where, you know, I also think in different states, you're seeing impacts in productivity because I'm also having people say to me, I'm finding work from home not as productive. And part of that is because those corridor conversations I'm not having anymore. So there's some really good yes. elements of this. And it's about when we move into whatever the new normal looks like, how do we take the best of this and then blend it with the best of the past? Yeah, because we can't go back to what it was in February 2020. That's gone. Um, we can mourn it, but we need to bury it and, and find a new, as you say, a new normal. You talk about toxic leadership in the book and how it can destroy businesses, and it is more prevalent than what we realise. Tell me some examples of what toxic leadership looks like. The, the biggest danger with toxic leadership is it's contagious and the re mm. research shows this. So, you know, emotions are contagious. We know that. So if someone feels sad or happy or angry, it, it can infect the people around them, either in a good way or a not so good way. Um, and so when we look at what we call abusive supervision, so when you have leaders who are toxic and you know, abuse their power, that feeds down to the people that they work with. And that person as a, you know, direct report is more likely to then display abusive supervision to their direct reports. Um, and so, you know, it not only has direct impact in terms of um, turnover and productivity and employee engagement, also, I think the big thing for organisations, if you look at oh &S laws, we have strict liability laws for oh &S, which around, you know, bullying and victimisation all come into oh &S realm. If you are a senior leader and you have people on your watch who are ineffective and bad, toxic leaders and, but, and they're doing things that are causing mental health and distress to the people around them, 
you have liability issues. Yeah, and, you know, it's a, mm, I think everyone listening to this will be able to think of people in their businesses who display these behaviours. And it's so imperative for senior leadership to pull these leaders up and say, it's not acceptable and it's not acceptable in this workplace and put a plan in place for them to repair and fix their behaviour, isn't it? It is. And it's about going, okay, what's the culture I want in the organisation? And then also recognising leadership is a learned skill. And so I always say to people, you know, if you find someone who's, you know, a bad leader, don't just go, you're out. Work with them, coach them, develop them. Because if they've got the desire to change and the desire to learn, you can turn it around. And so, you know, in the book, I talk about that. I talk about the different stages that you go through and then give them time, develop them. But then if you get to a point where you go, I'm not seeing that they want to change and we've invested a lot of time and energy and money and it's not changing, then it's time to go. But I think you need to be fair to them as well. And also as a senior leader, ask yourself two questions what's the pressure I'm putting on them? And is that pressure fair? Because perhaps they're a toxic, bad leader because they're just not coping with the enormous amount of pressure that's being put on them. And perhaps there's also something in the culture and the environment that is triggering their behavior. So it's really easy for us to finger point, but all, and this is what you'll see throughout the whole book. It's very much about each person owning their part and really critically assessing what, what am I doing? What have I contributed to this? And am I somehow making this worse? Do I need to change first before I expect that other person to change? Other person to change. Because you talk also about um, a a couple of myths around leadership in the book, and I'm going to throw a couple of them to you, and I'd love you to expand on that. And one of the ones you talk about is leadership is a title. I think we often see, we still think hierarchically in organisations, you know, the further up the organisational food chain you are, the bigger, the more power you have. And, they, they, you know, that is true. Big roles have big power with them. But leadership is also about just recognising that there's an ability to improve something. There's an ability to have an impact and make a difference. You can do that regardless of whether you have the title or not. Um, and if you're in a role where you have influence, that doesn't mean you're necessarily leading people, but you can influence the people around you by how you behave, how you connect and engage with people, by what you say and by what you do. And so I always think it's about, you know, everyone in the organization really getting clear. Who am I? What do I stand for? What's the type of person I want to be? How do I want to treat people? And what do I want them to say about me when I'm not in the room? Because you can Mm. have so much influence even when you're not in that official leadership title. Yeah, I love that. When you're not in the room, that is so important, isn't it? Um, The other one you talk about is leadership is one size fits all. I think it's particularly played out through COVID. And I keep reminding people that leadership is personal and leadership is contextual. And by that, I mean what you are needing from a leader changes as your environment changes and the dynamic changes. So in COVID, some of the things that we've needed from leaders have been different things to what we've ever needed before. But also leadership is personal, meaning that everyone's leadership style needs to be authentically theirs. And, you know, if I go back through my corporate career, you know, there was a leadership program. I tended to be on it, but, you know, I learned to be an authentic leader and an adaptive leader and a systems thinker and a dynamic leader and an integrated leader. And that all these great kind of programs and I learned a lot about myself and so they were fantastic but the danger with all of those is you end up with this sense that here's the 10 things do these 10 things tick the box and then your leadership game is nailed and it doesn't work like that because leadership continues to evolve your understanding of yourself continues to evolve and so the leadership that is required from you in the environment that you're in you may move somewhere else and what they need from you is different. And it doesn't mean you lose your values. It doesn't mean you stop being who you are, but you need to recognize that you might need to change some elements of yourself to be able to thrive in that environment. Yeah. The other one that you talk about, and I love this one, is that leaders have no emotion because we all do. And most of us, if we are authentic to who we want to bring to the table, and I know I am, I can I can be very emotional in my certain leadership roles or in in um, situations that I might be in. Talk to me about that myth. I think it's because if we go back through, you know, even sort of probably over the last, you know, 40, 50 years of management and leadership, there was this sense of, you know, the professional leader, the professional mm-hmm. manager, you know, and here's the facade, don't blend personal and professional. But what we know, you can't do that 
you know, we are integrated individuals and our emotions go with us. So bad home life that comes into the work environment. And so really understanding that you, you need to recognize as a, your leader, what are your emotions? What are triggering your emotions? Why are you thinking and feeling in a certain way? And there are times and a place where actually showing emotion at work is really powerful. Now, this isn't the get angry emotion where you get the stapler and you throw yeah. the stapler at your <laughs> staff. But, you know, at the moment where there's a lot going on, yes. it can be really powerful to say to your team, wow, I feel this. I can really feel the heaviness. Now, there's a big difference between doing, doing that and doing that. Oh, my God, the world is ending. The world is ending. Because that doesn't give comfort to teams. Mm. It, you know, people want to work with people who have a sense of strength yes. and, they, and provide a sense of security. That doesn't mean that you can't show emotion and you can't talk about how you feel. And that is, you know, it takes a while to figure out what's the fine balance between how much you share and what you hold sacred and what you hold back on. And, you know, you learn that because it's like you test the waters. If I say this hasn't worked, if I do this, doesn't work. If it doesn't hold back. Hold back. It, yeah. 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 And and you talk about, you know, just going back that toxic leadership piece. I'm just sitting here thinking, we talked about what a toxic leader looks like. What what do you do if you work for one? Do you do you actually should you have the courage to give them feedback on how some of their behaviors are diminishing? Because that's that's a big ask, isn't it? It is. And I think it really depends on the type of leader they are. So in the book, I distinguish between different types of leaders. Um, And there can be leaders who are really tough and they can have you know, a challenging impact, but they still care about their team. And so I know, I, I know for one example, for me, I worked with that person who was a very tough person to work for, but they genuinely cared about their team and they were doing something that was having an impact on me in a way that wasn't really all that much fun. And so I sat down and I had the conversation with them and they were really open to hearing it mm. uh, because it was about, I really want to bring out the best. I want to bring my best and I'm feeling as though I can't bring my best because of these reasons can we talk about this? And we sat down and we had a great conversation and I was misunderstanding where they were coming from. And so that's very different to working for someone who's the classic narcissist who thinks they are the best thing that is out there and they can charm the pants off you, but they will throw you under the bus if it's going to make themselves look good. That person, they're not interested. And so what it's very much about is understanding, okay, I get what that person's about. What I need to do is protect myself. Think long-term in this role in terms of what am I gaining from this role? What are the benefits of being here? But also keep my own counsel because sharing how I feel, to be frank, they just don't care. They don't care. You talk, and I love this, if people listening to this, you must go and buy this book, particularly if you're a leader, new in the role, emerging leader, or it just really any any level of leadership that you've been in, it's fantastic because you talk about the, um, the playbook, the leadership playbook, and I want to go through some of these with you as well because um, the one I love the most is where you say open your heart and mind and have high levels of self-awareness. It's one of, one of your playbook advices in the book. But how hard is it and... How easy is it to tell to believe what you tell yourself? Because you know, I can wake up every morning and go, You're an awesome leader, girl. Go out there and just lead. And you know, I can believe that every day if I tell myself that, right? So how do we not do that? Well, and I think it's also a balance because I think um, there are some leaders who, if you struggle with self-confidence, um, you probably do need to say a little bit more of that to yourself <laughs> to actually make yourself feel good about yourself. Look, I think it's a balance. And I think one of the key things is who have you got around you that's holding the mirror up to you? Like Who's that. the person who challenges you about how you see the world? And I mean, I would say for me, I was very, I had a lady in my team and she was almost, she played that role, but I also had my husband and my <laughs> Craig is awesome. He's very good at telling me how it is. And it's because I would replay scenarios with him um, and he'd be going, really? Do you really think that's where they're coming from? What if they were coming from this perspective? And he'd just leave it with me. And then I'd go away and think about it and go, actually, you're right. If they were coming from that perspective, then it doesn't mean this, it means this. And so it's having people around you. And, you know, I was also very fortunate. I had a very good executive coach for a big um, part of my corporate career as well, is having people around you who can challenge you, Mm. challenge how you see the world. And I think that's the hardest thing is we, you know, we think our brain is this beautiful, meaning-seeking, infallible machine. 
and it's not. Our brain constructs a version of reality and we're making decisions on what we're going to be doing now based on what we've done in the past because our brain is a pattern recognition machine, just recognizes patterns and goes, oh, damn, I've done this before. This is how I need to do it now. As a, and if you don't have people around you who can challenge your perspective and challenge your assumptions, you very quickly fall into that trap of going, well, this is the way it is. And well, actually, that's not the way it is mm. because that's just your frame of reference. Mm, I love that. I love the fact that your brain is a pattern and it recognises some of the behaviours that you've done in the past and it thinks you're going to do the same thing again. I, I want to talk about authenticity because, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, it sometimes can be an overused word where we say to leaders, you know, bring your authentic self to the table. And what I find challenging is that and particularly for women leaders, is that we uh, fear bringing our authentic self to the table because we'll be judged or we feel that we've got to be like the male leaders in our environment and so we bring something to the table. And I was one of these people and I look back on it now and I think, God, I used to put my shoulder pads on and never wore a skirt to work. I wore pants. I had a suit jacket on. You know, I had this very male persona around my leadership style What's your advice for leaders to, to have the courage to bring their authentic selves to the table? I'm going to say something that will probably shock you. <laughs> um, are you going to be judged? Absolutely. Yeah. Because that's what people do. And I mean, and it sounds awful. It's about accepting that that's what people do. People size people up, people judge, people make snap assessments. Doesn't mean it's right in terms of their assessment. Doesn't mean it, it's wrong. That's just, you know, that's what humans do. You know, we, the first time we meet someone within about seven to 15 seconds, we work out, do I like you, trust you, want to do business with you? It's what we call in psychological terms, thin slicing. We take very thin pieces of information and work out whether we like that person. It can be whether they've maintained eye contact, you know, in the olden days, how they shook hands, what they were wearing. And so what I've learned is to just accept I am going to be judged and actually that's okay. I can't force everybody to like me, but what I can do is be really true to my values, be really clear about what I stand for and back that my values, if I'm making a value-driven choice, then that's okay. Mm. And that if I strive for everybody to like me, then I'm never going to get anywhere and also you end up making a really watered down decision. And I actually think there's a weakness with that. I used to work with a person um, and in many respects, an awesome leader, but never wanted to say no. And so the challenge was say yes to everybody. And then we would figure out later that he'd said yes to many of us in ways that con con contradicted each other. Oh, so it meant no. that we were working on conflicting programs. Yeah. And then when you go and talk to him about it, he'd go, oh, yeah, well, I knew you guys would figure out eventually. Um, and so I look at that and go, he always wanted people to like him. And I think that's the challenge as a leader. You know, you don't rush out going, I want everyone to not like me. But with leadership, you have to make tough decisions. Mm. But as long as you're making those decisions and you're doing it in a way with care and compassion and that you're doing it where it's not about just your needs, because I think that's a real trap as a leader that you're only thinking, you know, you can't just think about yourself. You have to think about everybody else. Um, and that you're making a decision that is fair and equitable, then you can be comfortable that you've done the right thing. You've done the right thing. You talk about um, how you can't lead from the front in the comfort of your corner office. I love that. I, I want to print that line up, and put it out everywhere because it's so, so true. So what does leading from the front actually look like? Well, I, I share the story of um, Henry V. It's one of my favourite Shakespearean plays. Um, and if you haven't seen the Kenneth Branagh movie version, and I've just dated myself, um, <laughs> for anyone who's uh, listening to this, go and watch it. It's Kenneth Branagh in fine form. Um, but it's very much saying, you know, I think as leaders, if you really want to understand what's going on for the people that you work with, you need to get amongst it. And it's too easy to be remote. It's too easy to lock yourself away, be in an office, have a gatekeeper, send lots of emails. You might pick up the phone occasionally, you do a town hall meeting, but you're never really understanding and connecting with people and knowing what's going on around you. And so it is, it's getting out on the shop floor. It's going to the local um, branch. It's really talking to your team and finding out 
what's working? How do you feel? What's going on? What's, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And be really careful about gatekeepers. I still remember this would have been quite early in my career. And um, I was ringing a very, very senior executive and I was in a very junior role at the time. And I think I was really nervous about ringing this person, but I was thinking, okay, I'm ready for it. I'm going to get the EA and that's okay. I'm just going to ring the EA and then I'll get a time to talk to him. And, you know, it's all going to be okay. Anyway, I rang and he picked up the phone and I was still (laughs) almost like dropping the phone thinking, oh my God, he answered the phone. And I actually said to him, oh, um, you know, it's Michelle Gibbings. And he he knew me. He goes, oh, oh, hello. I said, I didn't think you'd pick up your phone. I was expecting your assistant to pick up your phone. And he said to me, and it was a great piece of advice. He said, no, he goes, no gatekeepers. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I don't want someone filtering who I hear from and who I don't hear from. And he said, so they do not answer my phone calls. Uh, And this person was in a very, very senior position in this Mm. very big organization. And I remember thinking, wow, that's really interesting. And I think what often happens in in leadership roles, and it's done with good intent, is they put all these sort of hurdles around. And it's because they're busy. And so they're trying to filter who they really need to spend time with. But the challenge with that is, are you just hearing from the people that you yeah. always hear from? Yeah. Which means you're only ever getting one message and perhaps you're only getting the message that everything's awesome. And in fact, it's not, not everything is awesome. Mm. It, it, you talk about breaking your power addiction because um, one of the things I've noticed is leadership is, is it, there's a difference between leadership in power and empowering, isn't there? But what, what in your, in, in the book, you describe it beautifully, but, Talk to us about that, the difference between power and empowering. It's, look, it's interesting because leaders often don't recognise that they have power. And so if you go back to sort of, you know, the old sort of versions of power, there's different sources of power. So we talk about expert power, people who are experts have power. People who have information have power. People who are in hierarchical positions have power. And that means you have the power to make decisions, impact people's lives for good or for bad. The challenge as a leader is you often don't recognize how much power you hold. Mm. Um, and one of my all-time favorite academics, and obviously, you know, a bit of a fangirl because I think this guy is just fabulous in terms of the work that he does. He runs Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center. Um, and Dasha Keltner does a lot of work looking at power and how power impacts how you process information and how you think and how you see the world. And what his research shows is that people who feel more powerful are more likely to cheat, break road rules, and just genuinely think the rules don't apply to them. Don't apply to them. And so what happens is he says, you know, we don't steal power. We don't take it. He goes, power is given. And it's given to you because you've done good stuff. And so power gets conferred on you. And then what happens is your very experience of having power actually corrupts the reason why you got the power in the first place. And so the challenge with all of this is as leaders is going, how do I recognize that I've got power? Because if I think and I feel more powerful, I am more likely to think that my opinions are right. And that's the biggest danger. Because if you think you've got your opinions are right and you've got all these powerful people hanging out together, you've just stopped listening to mm. other voices and you're not hearing different opinions. And so that's very different to empowerment where when you're empowering people, you're working with your team, you're understanding them, what brings out the best in them. And what you're doing is you're saying, I'm actually distributing power. I'm giving power to all of you to actually, I'm going to be here. I'm going to support you. I'm going to help understand what your needs are so you can bring your best to work every day. God, I could talk to you all day about this. But I'm going to ask you one last question before we finish this off. What is your advice to leaders right now? Um, And I understand it's very different around the country or globally, really, because we're all at different stages. So right now and then, you know, let's do some, you know, 2021. I think the world will be very different. We find a vaccine and we're in a very different space. How is how do you see your advice to leaders as we flow through from what we where we are today to this the new normal we're going to go into? That's a really interesting question, and I think the biggest challenge is I feel like we're all kind of clinging on to this hope that twenty twenty one everything's going to be better. Yeah, and it I am, I am. It, it, well, and that, there's no guarantees, and yeah. I think that's the the danger. Um, you know, it's interesting because they talk about hope and it's really important to have hope. But at the same time, if you have too much hope and invest too much in something happening and then it doesn't and your expectations are kind of like blown out of the water, that can have a real 
really negative impact psychologically. And so I would be working with my team around, let's, okay, let's look to the future. Let's start thinking about some things that are positive milestones. I think it's really important to have positive punctuation points through the week and through the month, because what can feel like at the moment is it feels like there's no sense of progress in a way that feels positive. And so find those little punctuation points that are positive, but don't hang your hope on one big thing and that one big thing turning everything around to what it used to be, because I just don't think it's going to happen like that. It's going to take a, it's going to take a long time. Um, and we will see some positive outcomes in terms of, you know, I often think as humans, we're incredibly resilient um, and we're already seeing it. You know, they're, yes, they're accelerating certain technologies um, through all of this. So the workforce and how we work is going to change. I'm loving the way you're seeing companies now talking about it's not work from home, it's work from anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when you go, how awesome is that? I mean, it means you now have a global talent pool, but it also means for people locally, don't get complacent because the talent pool is just expanding. And so as leaders, as employees, it's more important than ever to go, what am I doing to make sure that I am always fit for the future? What am I learning? Where am I you know, getting new access to information and knowledge? Um, and particularly if there are people listening to your podcast at the moment, who are in transition roles or looking for work. And that's, you know, looking for work itself can be a full-time job, but also make sure, find some time to upskill. There's heaps of stuff out there that is free. And so, you know, look at your mass online open courses, Coursera, um, Udemy, edX, great courses, get the content, uplift your knowledge. Great advice. So go out and buy the book. Bad boss, what to do if you work for one, manage one or are one. I've read it. Um, if you've heard this podcast, you will know that you will get so much value out of the book. Thank you for your time. Um, seriously, I could talk to you all day and I think people could listen to you all day. Are you available to do speaking as well as we, you know, around the country and offshore? How, how do people get, get hold of you, Michelle? Um, so the best way to reach out to me is through my website, which is michellegibbings.com. Um, and there's a form you can fill out um, or email support at michellegibbings.com. But I am doing a lot of Zoom presentations at the moment. I'm spending my life. I had to laugh. Someone introduced me the other day and said, you know, she's a global speaker. And I thought, yeah, I haven't left my study since March. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> take it. I'd take it. <laughs> so if you're listening to this and you want Michelle to speak to your leader leadership team or to your team, please go to our website and book her in. Um, fantastic content. Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Please take a few moments to rate, review and subscribe to our podcast. Until next time, stay safe and stay connected.